Welcome to the Waiting Room Revolution. On this episode, we talk with Sue Robbins. She's a senior partner with Bird Communications, a health communications company. She's a family advisor, a sought after speaker, and an advocate on Twitter about patient and family centered care and co design. We talk about her newest book, Ducks in a Row, about why we need to reimagine healthcare and how to do it. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sue. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited because I've, I've read about a lot of your work and your, your um, passion for transforming the healthcare system and making it more focused on patients and families. And I've read that the origin of that came from your experiences with your son. And so could you tell us more about that? Yeah, for sure. I've, I've actually worked in healthcare my whole life, but not as a clinician. So I've had all sorts of jobs like uh, staffing coordinator, the person who calls nurses in um, when they're short staffed. And I've been a unit clerk and I worked as a nursing attendant. And I was actually in nursing school for two years before I uh, transferred out and ended up getting an English degree. So I'd say that I dabbled in healthcare a bit uh, from one side of the gurney, as they say, uh, until my youngest son, Aaron, was born. And Aaron was born 18 years ago. He's uh, my third son, and he was born with Down syndrome, which uh, came as a surprise to us. And what I like to say is really the trajectory of our whole lives changed uh, when that doctor uttered that diagnosis that Aaron had Down syndrome and really introduced me to healthcare uh, in a totally different way. And I think Aaron actually, because you know, my I had two other children, he actually introduced me to motherhood in a whole different way. So I learned how to be a mom differently. I certainly learned that I had to be an advocate, which was not something that I ever needed to do with my other two children. And so he was a big factor, I think, in you know, embracing the world of unpaid work and caregiving and getting involved politically and volunteering with our Down syndrome association to start up a support group and you know doing all these things that us caregivers do to try to you know make the world a better place. But at the same time, I had to take him to all these medical appointments, and none of which were coordinated. And some of the experiences there were not ideal. And I remember thinking, I think this could be better. Sue, so what were you most shocked about when you were encountering the healthcare system, especially with a medically complex child? I mean, do you have any stories to illustrate what that was like? Aaron, at the beginning, got a referral to go see a geneticist. I'm not really sure why. He didn't really need to see one, but I think our family doctor didn't know what to do with us, so he referred us to a geneticist. So we went to the genetics clinic. And the geneticist happened to have a student with her. And so what they did when we came in, and Aaron was about two weeks old, just a tiny little baby, um, is that they, she decided she was going to teach her student about the markers of Down syndrome. So there's many physical markers for Down syndrome. And so what she did was she, you know, looked at the palm of his hands and where his ears were between his toes and like all these markers. But the way she did it, she treated him like he was a specimen, not like he was a little baby. And I remember being so jarred by that and, and like uncomfortable with that because he wasn't being treated like he was a baby first, who was very much loved by his family. And you know, we had another cardiology appointment where I remember the cardiologist at the end of the appointment, she was very brusque with us. She um, just picked up her, in the olden days, this is 20 years ago, dictation tape thing, you know, the the things they do their dictation for their charts and and instead of saying goodbye she just started dictating the the notes from our visit when we were still there in the room and I remember thinking gosh like this is weird like what is going on here um and so I kind of had this question in my head and thinking I I think things could be better than this. And then we met our pediatrician (laughs) and we got referred to a pediatrician. Her name was Dr. Darwish when Erin was two months old. And the experience at her office was totally different than all those experiences with those specialists that we'd had before before that point. And then I realized 
that healthcare can be full of kindness and humanity and compassion because she in fact embodied that herself. So I think if anybody wonders why does Sue do this work, we can all blame Dr. Darwish, who was a wonderful, beautiful woman who actually passed away when Erin was two. So we only had two years with her. Um, but really, she showed me there could be a better way. Yeah, I love that. It's about kindness. I'm interested to contrast your experience with Dr. Darwish as a mom with your experience as a patient when you dealt with breast cancer. I mean, you've talked openly about this and you've even said, that you felt like you've had PTSD each time you went into a cancer center. Yeah, I, uh, so it's interesting because I feel like when I was Aaron's advocate, I kind of hid behind him a little bit. So there's this mama bear persona, I think that lots of us moms in the pediatric health world put on, and it's actually kind of a safe thing. It's almost like you put on this big mama bear outfit to protect yourself. Um, and so I was a pretty good advocate um, by the time I got diagnosed with breast cancer, which was five years ago. So Aaron was 13 years old. Um, but then when I got cancer, it was a totally different experience. I, so many people said to me, oh, you know how to advocate because you're a caregiver and you're, you know, and actually everything I learned kind of went out the window because it was, I was the one that was actually sick. And I was the one that felt very, very fragile and vulnerable. And I was unable to speak up much in meeting, you know, in, in, in appointments with my oncologist, I'd sit there feeling very small, which is kind of how the whole thing was set up was to diminish power with patients. And I was actually shocked because I thought that this is such a naive thing and it shows the pecking order of diagnoses in healthcare, but I thought cancer patients got treated pretty well in the hospital because you have cancer and it, it's kind of a terrifying thing because you're looking at your own mortality. And I found that actually that wasn't true in the hospital I went to. I was just another middle-aged breast cancer patient. Like I wasn't, it wasn't a big deal to them. The staff didn't care. They saw, you know, hundreds of us every day. And I, I feel as if, if I had been treated more tenderly and with more kindness through that patient experience, I wouldn't have been traumatized I, I, right now, when I go back, I go to my mammograms. I have to go for regular mammograms and ultrasounds at the cancer hospital. I still can't park in the parkade there. I have to park far away and walk in. And that actually helps me garner some sort of strength in order to go back into that building where I got my radiation treatment, because I, I, I can't think of any other reason except that I was traumatized there. Yeah, you're not the first person to share with me that they felt like the experience lacks humanity and is traumatizing, not from the disease itself, but from how the system is set up and how it makes you feel. I think that's why we started the Waiting Room Revolution podcast and movement. I mean, we wanted to change that. And it was trying to reclaim some of that power back for patients and families. You know, we wanted to empower them so they could have more control and choice in their illness experience. and to try to find uh, skills or actionable things they could do to leach out a better approach that met their needs and kept them in the know the whole time so that we didn't have to only rely on enlightened or kind healthcare providers to provide patient-centered care or just to wait for healthcare reform and policy change. I, I think, I've been like one of these people that has joined every committee, been on every council, you know, chaired, th like I've done everything, particularly in the pediatric world, to try to what I call change the system. And your people who are listening can't see this, but I would put that in quotes because I have found through 20 plus years of doing this work, in fact, I'm not sure the system we can change the system. I think that we can change ourselves. Like that's what, that's the conclusion that I've come to. And so the idea, and when you talk about empowering, I talk a lot in my second book about power in healthcare and how it's like a, it's like a pie. And that if some people, it's limited, there's finite power. If some, if some people have all the pieces and they say they want to bring patients and, and families in, you know, for engagement purposes or to make sure they can do shared decision making or whatever reason, well, they have to give up some of their power. Like, because we can't have a relationship if I'm totally powerless and you're the person that's got all the power. Like that's just destined to fail. 
So I think it's good to be aware of some of these. I mean, there's two different kinds. Like, are you working mostly with people who want to be empowered at point of care, or it's also people who want to make system change? Is it a combination of both? You know, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, certainly our listeners are people facing serious illness as a patient or a family member, and they want to be empowered at their point of care. But many times after that experience, they realize that it was less than ideal, and they also want to be effective system change agents. Um, and of course, both these groups can include healthcare providers. So I think there's a recognition amongst our listeners that we can't just make change by hoping to educate healthcare providers. Um, we want to know what actions we can take ourselves. And so that brings me to my next question. Uh, you've been on both sides, right? As a patient with breast cancer and as a family member, uh, a mother of a medically complex child, what are the skills required to make the system work for you? Um, are they the same or are they different as a patient and as a caregiver? I think I think we do way too much siloing in healthcare and cutting things up into specialty areas. And I think the work that you're talking about can apply to everybody. And I mean, I mean, the skill is is to learn something and then to be able to adapt it to your own situation. So that's what I think. Like if we're talking generally, anybody who has an encounter with the healthcare system, particularly maybe not somebody who broke their leg and is going to the hospital. Like, like we always talk about you know, there's different kinds of patients, although their patient experience is important too. And maybe that is the worst thing that's ever happened to them. So I don't want to diminish. We often do this pecking order, right? Of which is more important than other things as far as healthcare. So, so those, I think for anybody knowing, like you said, what you don't know and knowing what your rights are and knowing that it's okay to speak up, but also being honest about what happens if you're the person who speaks up and not thinking, I think I bought into a notion, which I think was actually a lie that if I spoke up in healthcare, whether it's a point of care or in a committee meeting or something, I would be able to make a difference and change the healthcare world. And that to me has been very discouraging over the years. I could speak up and not even make a difference for myself, right? Like, and healthcare is very reluctant to entertain constructive feedback, I find, especially here in Canada. And I think that is something to do with our Canadian culture, that we're not supposed to complain, we're supposed to be happy, it's not as bad as it is in the States, right? You're just supposed to kind of shut up and put up with it because we have Medicare here. And really what I would say, it is your right to speak up. And as a mom of a kid with a disability, it actually is, was my job. Like that was my job is to protect him. He would have, gosh, there's so much he would have missed out on if I hadn't been there beating on my drum over and over again. And, but it's hard. Like, and I think we need to support people to do that. Um, many of us caregivers are gentle, quiet, introverted type people. We care about other people. We don't like attention to ourselves. And I um, once did a talk for a bunch of pediatric, advanced pediatric nurses and said to them, like, I'm a very reluctant advocate. These experiences as, as a mother, as a patient inspired you to write your first book, Bird's Eye View, Stories of a Life Lived in Healthcare. What was, what was the impetus behind that? And what was the main take home that you wanted the readers to really change? Yeah, it was, so it's interesting, Bird's Eye View. So can I read just like the quote in the very beginning of the book by Audre Lorde, who wrote a book that's called The Cancer Journals, which was a very powerful book for me to read when I got cancer. But she says, and when we speak, we are afraid. Our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. And I think, I mean, that's so beautiful. When we are silent, we're still afraid. So. I worked for many years in children's hospitals, coaching families to share their stories. And so I think the question you asked about empowerment, uh, my answer would be it lies in the stories. This is where the power is, I think, um, because it's we share our stories as patients and caregivers. We do. Like you're in a, a clinic room with somebody and they ask you about your medical history. Well, talking about that is a way of sharing stories. 
or if you get a chance to maybe edu- go to Grand Rounds and educate a bunch of doctors, right? Like you have to know how to create a story, to craft a story in order to make a difference or hopefully make a difference. And so one thing I think is very powerful is for people to understand their own story and be able to communicate it in lots of different ways. Bird's Eye View is my personal stories of my life lived in healthcare. And the reason I published it first is I felt like if I was telling patients and families that they need to tell their stories in order for change to happen, um, then I had to do that myself. So it's a very personal book. Um, Although people call it a memoir and I don't think of it that way because I purposely wrote it. My editor helped me with this a lot with lessons in each of the chapters that could be taken away by a health professional that read it. And I was thinking truly when I was writing it, you know, when you write something, you kind of have your audience in mind as you're writing it. I was thinking, what would I say if I stood in front of a group of medical students? And that's what bird's eye view is. That's what I want them to know, A, both about having having a disabled child and B, about having breast cancer. So that's where that came from. This is a very personal book. And how is that connected to your just released second book, Ducks in a Row, Healthcare Reimagined? I'm curious, there was some time in between, but what drove you to pursue a hope, which is a lot of work to write another book, but what drove you, uh, how is this one building on that one? What were you trying to get across? Yeah, well, so I, I wrote the two books at the same time, like it was one huge book. And I've been writing on my website forever and having things published. And so some of it, it wasn't like it came fresh. This is based on my experience. So I've been collecting all this for many, many years in my journals and everything. But then I realized that Bird's Eye View was the personal piece and I needed to tell that first. And then, and it came out right before the pandemic, which was not the best timing. It came out in October, 2019. And there are some constructive feedback, I would say, as far as my experience, especially in the cancer hospital. And at the beginning of the pandemic, wasn't a good time to be speaking up about healthcare in that way. But I'm hoping Dex in a Row, it's a different book and it's coming at a different time. And it really is about my work in healthcare, working with families and patients, and also what we can each individually do to make healthcare a kinder and more compassionate place. And I kind of diss the idea of system change. And I go back to the old serenity prayer and say, what is in your control? What is not in your control? And what can you do in your own sphere of influence if you work in healthcare to make it a kinder, more tender place? And it's interesting. One of the things I talk about a lot is waiting rooms, like literally physical waiting rooms. And um, I've got lots of very practical. It's kind of a lofty book but it contains a lot of practical ideas. It's a combination of both. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Your work to reimagine healthcare and the waiting room revolution movement, like they have a lot in common, especially with the idea of trying to change things from the bottom up or the middle out. I'm curious, we struggled a bit with the words of empowerment and activation because for some patients and families, it was a real turn off because it felt like more work for them. I'm curious, what's your take on those words, empowerment and activation? Words are hard, I think, because everybody feels differently. It's like, what word should we use? Well, the answer is it depends, right, on all sorts of things. I guess the one thing about the word empower is that I think patients already have power. I think, so maybe activates better. Like you're kind of triggering it, you're lighting it, like it's blooming, like it's already in there. Um, or if people say I'm empowering you, well, that means they overtly have to give up some of their power, like I said. So, and I don't think that this happens nearly enough in healthcare. Like in Ducks in a Row, I talk about three main things. And one of them is you talk about engaging patients. And I think engagement, patient engagement of any sort is about outreach. So it is about going out to the people to where they are, not always expecting them to come to you. So like you said, that people don't necessarily want to go to the cancer hospital. So I've got like a million stories when I worked in the hospitals, going over to mom's houses with the, you know, sitting on the floor with their babies and meeting them for coffee and taking them for lunch and going for walks. And, you know, the idea that 
that that's one way that you can give power back to the people is actually the physical setting of where you get together. So, so there's some little tricks, I think, that are just really little adjustments in there um, that we can do quite easily, even at work for the staff. And it's a book for staff and patients, anyone who's unhappy with healthcare, that's what I say, which kind of includes everybody now. But I would go for walking meetings with them. I wouldn't sit in a board room with them if the weather was decent and I live outside Vancouver. So unless it was pouring rain, we would actually go for a walk and have a conversation that way. And just trying to infuse some of these human pieces into healthcare, I think is important because I feel strongly healthcare has become extremely corporate and based on efficiencies and the boardrooms and the people with their expensive shoes and all the consultants. And, and I would really like to, you talk about empowering, take that away from those folks and give the power back to the people. So if I can continue on this idea of language, I know two of your favorite words in healthcare is kindness mm -hmm. and love. And I wonder if what you would say to some people who have, you know, worked very hard in medical school to who've had to tough, you know, who to survive that in this environment, you have to sort of, um, I don't want to write words. They can't be too soft and delicate. Um, yes, this yes. idea of this, is it too airy fairy kindness and love? Like why, why, um, what's the rebuttal to that? That people who feel like love is not the answer. Oh, I hear that a lot. So that's, you know, I heard, recently in a group, like, don't use the word love, you'll antagonize all the physicians, right? Like, so I do hear that. And it is a common, but I think there are some physicians that do practice with love. Like, I think I'm not trying to convince folks who don't believe in this. I've kind of given up on that. That's that whole change the world thing. I think there are a lot of people who want to work from a place of love. They want to go, that's why they went to healthcare to begin with. They felt like the system with its efficiency and its checklists and you know the, the bad staffing, like all the things they do to people, it kind of extinguishes that love that they had and that passion that they had. And what I'm interested in is, I think the revolution comes from putting it back. Like we all need that. Like for us to care for ourselves, we need to feel cared for. And that includes both staff and patients. And um, I don't know, people say soft stuff. It's interesting because, you know, I've got that nursing background and an English degree. So it's kind of the le left brain, right brain thing. And I have to say the best clinicians, the best people who work in healthcare have both. They've nurtured both parts. They're not purely scientists. They've also got this so-called soft, softer side to that. I don't think there's anything wrong with being soft. I say in my book, I don't want to sleep on a hard pillow. I want to sleep on a soft pillow, like a, a soft place to land when you're vulnerable and suffering in healthcare seems to me to be a pretty attractive place to be. There's a common thread between your work and ours in Waiting Room Revolution, right? Of trying to be hopeful and optimistic. And we really push back against this idea that all good ideas have to be large scale policy change, but rather that it could be many people doing small actions. All, you know, the collective work of that can lead to massive change. Do you have any examples of small actions that you took? Another thing that I did just myself personally, at, and this might sound a bit silly, but what I, I had this like book of quotes, you know, those rip off quotes, they've got little inspirational quotes on them. And I had one of those in my office. And what I did is I would take one and I would go to a public washroom and I would like tape it up on the wall. Like usually the washrooms would have like a bulletin board with infection control posters <laughs> and stuff on it. So I would put one of those little uh, quotes up on the wall. And then every few days, kind of totally randomly, I would change up the quotes and I would put up a different quote. And I never told anybody what I was doing. It was like my funny little secret Santa thing. And it actually gave me a lot of pleasure to do it. But then I heard that there's families who come in regularly for clinic at this particular center, and they would go and seek out that bathroom to go there specifically so that they could read the little quote that was taped up on the wall because it, it made them feel better. It gave them some joy, some comfort. And I think there's so many things in healthcare that could, they're little things, but they could make a huge difference. When you talk about waiting rooms, in my book, 
it's ducks in a row and in it, there's a whole bunch of ducks, like duck illustrations that have these little ideas that people can do. Because as you said, like we talk about this a lot, but what does this actually look like in action? And waiting rooms are kind of my bugaboo. I mean, we have them everywhere and a lot of them are physically terrible places. And what if we made the, heal the waiting rooms a healing place? Like what if we had like a nature channel on the television instead? When I was in cancer therapy, they had CNN on the TV and it was just after Trump was elected. So it would be all this yelling on CNN all the time. And there's us cancer patients sitting there in our gowns waiting for radiation treat. Like just even the feel, I can still feel how that felt. And, and or why, why are the lights so bright? Right. And why isn't there room for people to put their wheelchairs in waiting rooms? Why are they all the chairs lined up? And why are they? All, there's all these like random signs taped up all over the place in waiting rooms like they're they're very unsettling areas. And I think I have a, I have a chapter called um, low hanging fruit. And it's about how physical space is actually low hanging fruit. And it's something that can be tackled, I think, quite easily as opposed to me trying to change the minister of health, you know, mind, like, you know what I mean? Like there's these different levels of how we can like, like crack on change, like try to beat on change. And I think starting with these simple things first, but then not stopping there either. That's the problem. We do pilot projects here very well in Canada. So we'll do this one little, and then we'll just stop. So I think that's how ch change is going to happen as we build on these small things. Right. And then eventually it tips over. I've seen this in other places where they have patient or family um, with, with lived experience, you know, for that disease. And they, they have a little booth and, you know, if you're wanting to talk to someone and questions to another peer, you could go and talk to them and they're sitting there. And if you want quiet, you sit on the other side where of the waiting room, you know, we, you're right. The waiting room has really just been a storage place where we're just, you know, going to get your number will be called when we're ready and you come and it really can be a place even for connection or healing, if that's what you want it to be. If you want right, quiet, like meditation, options. yeah, that's always exactly. about options. There's so right? many things. And why wait there? Why there's the whole hospital? <laughs> Couldn't it's you just one, let me know when the time is? Because, you know, they're never on time. That's the other thing. Well, that's, um, a, that's a power thing, I'm afraid. Like, that's what that's yeah. about. Yeah, but yes, it's like, sure. and you're right about the peers. Like, the if, if folks who are listening who are caregivers, I would say, like, the number one thing that saved me after Aaron was born and I tried to go to like regular mom's groups, like I did with my other kids. Like I went to a mom and baby yoga class and another gym or music class. And I did not feel as if I belonged there. And so me finding my own group of moms that we didn't have to explain or apologize to each other. Like to me, the peer support part of being a caregiver is like one of the most important things and what and what health professionals can do is help join us together. Because often, you know, we don't even know where to start. One of our keys in Waiting Room Revolution is called Invite Yourself. It's actually, we end it because our whole point is now that you know this, you have to invite yourself to the conversation. Don't wait to be invited, speak up. Don't assume that no news is good news. But caregivers who have listened have told us over and over again, they're very scared to speak up. They're scared that they're going to be labeled as you know, that overbearing person, the hysterical parent, et cetera. And so what's your advice in um, how you can be a good storyteller or advocate, which, and not worry about the label, or do you worry about the label? Uh, yeah, I was, I don't know if there is a way to speak up and not get <laughs> labeled as difficult. I think that happens. People do that in their mental models, like immediately, let's put you in a box. If if you, I mean, there are ways to speak up and of course being respectful. It's interesting when I do talks, I've learned over the years, like I always start with something positive, always, always, always to, if I start with something negative, the audience shuts down. Like you can see them shutting down. It looks like the McDonald's drive-through window, right? Like it's like people, and then they're not open to listening to your message anymore. So I've learned no matter what's going on is I start with the positive and then if I have something that's negative, because there are lots of negative things in healthcare, believe me, to say, I always try to frame it so it's constructive. So I would say, this is what happened. This is how I felt about it. And here's how I wish it could be better. 
So I, I think that the approach of how you talk to folks is really, really important. And I also make sure I add the gratitude part afterwards too, no matter what. And, you, you know, I'm not trying to Pollyanna, believe me, I've been very angry about all sorts of things, especially during this pandemic. But I just think that people respond more to honey <laughs> uh, than it's just human nature to feel that way. And so really thinking about your approach and is it a positive or a negative one? And you can get constructive feedback through, but you don't have to do it in a way that makes people immediately feel defensive and, and shut down. So that would just be a, a, just kind of a, if you had to speak up, that's what, although I'm not, I'm not that good at that. I think of things afterwards, right? When I'm driving home, I think I should have said that. Darn, so I write about it. I often write about it. So I kind of cheat that way, but Anyways, it's it's a tricky place. And believe me, I've been called a hysteric, especially as a woman, we get called hysterical all the time. Um, but what I would say to other moms who have, say, disabled kids that they're caregiving for, I'd say, you were that's your job. You're doing what you're supposed to do. And kind of having peers to be able to talk to afterwards and stuff helps give you the strength to do what you can do. Because the fact, what I learned in healthcare when I first started is you have to follow up. You have to. Well, it won't surprise you that one of our seven keys is tag your it, is that you cannot assume um, that the system is going to connect all the dots. You're going to have to be the person to, you know, to bring pieces together, particularly transitions. And you can do it in simple ways or complex ways, but there's going to be somebody who has a role for that. Okay, so pivoting a bit and focusing on healthcare advocates, do you have any advice for people who are in those roles or who are being asked to join committees? on how to do system change effectively? It, first, I'd say be picky. So your time is valuable. I know often I would say in, yes to everything because I was like flattered to be asked. I thought someone wanted my opinion. Finally, somebody was listening to me. You know, I had a lot of reasons to say yes. So really considering and thinking about is this a good use of your time? Because really for the people asking, it is an honor for them, I think, to have you involved. And if you talk about empowerment and power, like really taking that back yourself and that your wisdom based on your experience is like gold. And so if you get any sense that you're not being treated well by the organization, like, I don't know, they're calling meetings short notice and, you know, like, you know, there's lots of, you're not getting paid for some of the work that you're doing. Like there's, there's lots of things that can happen with organizations who don't do engagement well. It's okay to say no, I would say. You don't have to say yes to everything. And I always, so I'm a very wise mom taught me once when I had a challenging experience um, on a healthcare council was never give them your whole heart because we, feel so passionate about this work. Um, and often when you're doing things at a system level, it's not about you or your experience, it's about others behind you. So we often feel very obliged to have to do this work, it's a responsibility. And so I just wanna say that it's actually okay to give, your, give yourself permission to say no as well, because other people will come and help. It's not only up to us. And otherwise it does can feel like a burden sometimes. So, you know, taking care of yourself in that and recognizing like, like Brene Brown says about stories, people who are storytellers, they're badasses. Like they're total bad, you're a total badass. And as she says too, like if you're not getting into the arena with me while I'm being a badass telling my story, you don't have a right to criticize me. So really, like feeling that what you have to say is important. And if people aren't respecting that, then it's okay to walk away. Awesome. And what advice do you have about how to tell effective stories and so that you can change people's minds or change people's hearts? I think it's a matter of looking at your, we all, most of us have really long, big stories. So looking at it, and I'm a communications person. So I think a lot about like, three key messages. That, that's kind of what you do in, in communications is think about that. So what are the three things that your audience, whether it's just one other person in the room or you're standing in front of an audience or you're writing something that people are reading that you want them to take away from what you have to say? Because I know from my experience, like if I wanna say everything that's ever happened in my son Aaron's life, that's like boiling the ocean. 
and then people really don't get the key message I'm trying to get across. So I'd say thinking about three key messages. And I'd also say it's really important, and you talked about this at the beginning, about your own why. So why are you telling your story? And if you had asked me that a few years ago, why I told the story of being Aaron's mom, I would have said to make a difference in the world. And what I have realized since then, we, you need to, I needed to dig deeper than that. So why was I telling Aaron's story? And the reason why was at the very root is that when a baby with Down syndrome is born, I want staff to say congratulations instead of I'm sorry. Like that was the root story of everything I told him when it's 18, it always comes back to that about valuing and celebrating him as opposed to seeing him as a tragedy. And so I think we, when we do storytelling, it's important, luckily I'm in therapy, so I can talk to my therapist about this, but it's important to really recognize why you're doing it, the underneath part, and make sure that your why is in alignment with whoever's asking you to share the stories why. That is really, really important and being super overt about that. So those, those are the things that I would say, your why and your three key messages about what you want to tell. And also, I, it's interesting, I just had a meeting today and talked about how do you want people to feel after they have listened to you? Like, and let's see, there's many things. I could give a big workshop about this, but the other thing is uh, uh, what action do you want them to take? That's another thing. I think especially healthcare professionals are very action task oriented. So what is the one thing you want them to do after you, they hear your story? My final question was, we like to end our interviews often with them. Um, do you have any advice for patients and families on how they can make uh, or to how they can have a better healthcare experience? My advice would be to know your own value and that you as a human, doesn't matter what's going on with you, have value. And I had a friend when I was in um, cancer treatment and going in for radiation appointments for 20 days and I was getting very worn down and discouraged. Uh, she said to me, do not forget that you are the queen, she said. That's what she said. You are the queen. And of course, I never act like I was some snotty queen or anything when I was in the hospital. I was very polite and compliant when I was there. But just even thinking that when I walked in, that I was an important person, no matter, you know, maybe the receptionist was rude to me and it would kind of make me feel less important. And then I had to sit in the waiting room in this stupid gown with the CNN on the TV. And then I feel like it's almost like every interaction you get more and more deflated. So coming in thinking that I deserve to be treated well and respected. Uh, and if you wanna think I am the queen or I am the king, just to give yourself some confidence, take some deep breaths before you, you, know, you walk into a clinic room, all that kind of thing I think is really important. And also you know, do the things you need to, to take care of yourself. Like I, I often, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll park far away and go for a walk so that I feel good by the time I get there. Or I'll pick up a coffee. I mean, this is pre-COVID, but I'll pick up a coffee because it kind of makes me feel better to have that as a crutch when I'm in, in the room. And so anything that you can really do, like these little habits, I think, is, is actually really helpful. And always hopefully have somebody that you can talk to afterwards. I think that debriefing part after any kind of healthcare interaction is really important. So Love it. Yeah. Sue, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, I, I, I very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to listen to our first season about the seven keys and to learn more. The podcast is produced and edited by me and Kayla McMillan. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast and help us get the word out.